The theme of Romans talk tonight is heaven's reward fallacy. The heaven's reward fallacy is a cognitive distortion or a belief system, a schema that causes you to view the world in a distorted fashion. The distortion is that you believe you will get good for the good that you do. Again, the distortion, heaven's reward fallacy, is believing that you should get good for all of the good things that you do. If you work hard and you do the right thing, then as a result, you will be rewarded in this lifetime for all of those good things that you've done. The reality of life doesn't exactly turn out to be that way, does it? Perhaps you might be one of those do-gooders yourself. You know, that perfect wife that always was taking care of the house, making sure that her husband had a lunch pack and the kids had a lunch pack, doing everything she ought to find yourself years later with your family destroyed and feeling like it is totally unfair. Or maybe you were that perfect husband, always came home after work on time as expected, turned in your paycheck like a report card and took care of the family's needs. You were there for them emotionally and available. You helped out with chores around the house to ease the burden on your spouse. But still, later you find yourself getting cheated on or being hurt or used and abused. Uh, many mothers who love their children so much find that their children later turn out to resent them and hate them, sometimes manipulated by their narcissistic ex. Many fathers find the same thing with their children. Uh, many conscientious employees uh, have sacrificed opportunities uh, to get ahead, have done what they ought to do, only to find themselves getting passed up again and again by their coworkers who are less conscientious and more selfish and self-driven. This can lead a person to wonder, should I just be bad since bad things or bad people seem to be getting all the good rewards? There's a news story that's cycling in entertainment news right now where a prominent music producer uh, was accused in a lawsuit filed by his ex-girlfriend of all types of abuse, sexual assault in some of the most heinous ways imaginable, physical assault, and in all the abuse that was alleged, the general uh, public is not so surprised by it because this person has garnered himself an image of a bad boy over the decades. But did he have to face the retribution? 24 hours later, the entire case was settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. And so it would appear he is not going to have to go to trial for all of the bad deeds that he is accused of. Again, this can lead people to feel like life is unfair. Why is it some of these people who are doing such bad things are actually getting away with it? Meanwhile, you have people like Maurice Hastings, who went to jail for something like 38 years for a crime back in 1980-something. It was a murder in 1980-something. Well, guess what? He didn't do it. So later, when the DNA evidence came through, 30-something years later, he was released from prison. Oh, thanks. I just spent 30-something years in jail for a crime I didn't even commit. A good thing can happen to a bad person, and a very bad thing can happen to a good person. You might be a person who is innocent as well, who didn't deserve to be abused by your parents, by your spouse. Maybe you were very cooperative, very easygoing, yet your parents were very harsh with you, or your spouse was uh, physically assaulting or otherwise verbally cutting you down. In the end, narcissistic spouses can 
uh, sue you, take what belongs to you, give you no credit or thanks for everything you sacrifice for them, and smear your reputation with a smear campaign where they're, you're so thoroughly slandered that you're not even able to work again in the industry that you once worked in. Your children then hate you, your brothers and sisters think ill of you, his entire family alienate you, and that may have been like family to you. And all of these things can happen when you didn't deserve it. Isn't that the case? If you're honest, can you think of some things that have happened to you that you just simply didn't deserve? Some abuse that you experience, some losses that you've taken that weren't because you did something bad. And so we have to have a mindset that fits the world we live in, because when we have heaven's reward fallacy, suddenly we're shattered when something bad happens to us, although we've been doing good, because we've always believed that if I do the right thing, if I am a good girl or a good boy, then everything good will come back to me. And, I, and everyone will treat me well. If I go and treat other people well, then I'll be treated well. If I do the right thing, if I just do the right thing, then good will come back to me. The reality of this universe, the reality of this world, is that it is topsy-turvy. It is unpredictable. And there are no guarantees that everything good you do will be rewarded in this lifetime. In fact, you may have found quite the opposite to be the case. In fact, you may have heard the jaded saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Have you ever heard that saying? No good deed goes unpunished. This is hyperbole to show that things that you do that are good can at times be met with criticism, being taken advantage of, uh, all the worst things can actually occur when you had all the best intentions. And so that's why people say no good deed goes unpunished. It's a poetic way uh, and it, to exaggerate the fact that you could have all the best intentions. Like uh, there's a prominent uh, internet influencer. He's taking his money and then he went and apparently he was going to uh, dig wells for water in poor countries in Africa. And then people criticized him and said, what do you think? You're some kind of white savior. <laughs> and so they wanted to cancel him for wanting to do something good. Well, it would appear as if no good deed goes unpunished, which is not exactly true, but it's certainly how it feels when you are trying to have good intentions and do what is right and as a result, it feels like you are being punished because things are going bad for you as a result. And so this brings in the concepts that may have supported your heaven's reward fallacy, such as the belief in karma. What goes around comes around. So if you go out and do something bad, then something bad will happen to you. If you do something good, then something good will happen to you. And the, so this general pop culture idea of karma has spread so that a person believes if anything bad has happened to them, it must be because they deserve it. And if anything good then is happening, then it must be because they deserve it as well. Or you could have been raised in a Christian culture in which you learned the concept, you reap what you sow. Again, pushing this idea that whatever you're feeling and experiencing must be because you caused it. Or in the Judaism, there's the concept of divine retribution, which again is the idea that God will take care of and punish those who are deserving of being punished. But yet again, there's dissonance because we're looking at the world we live in and seeing evil people doing evil deeds and seemingly getting no punishment at all. And meanwhile, you may have had all the best intentions and everything went wrong. So does that mean these concepts are not true? 
Well, whatever the case, these concepts are being misapplied and misunderstood. If you just take this concept of being able to reap what you sow, this refers to in farming, where a farmer will gather from the harvest, reap the same produce that they sowed or planted in, in the ground. So if they sowed wheat, then they will reap wheat. This concept is not meant to mean that everything you experience in life is a direct result of something you did, good or bad. This concept is meant to illustrate that there is cause and effect. And you will see the effects of the cause. And so if you touch what is hot, you may get burned. And the burn is the effect and the cause was you touching what was hot. This is a true concept and it does exist. There is cause and effect, even in more complicated situations such as uh, earning. If you work hard, you will likely produce more. As a result of producing more, you may be able to earn more. Uh, but uh, if you are lazy and you do not work hard, then you will grow your poverty, you will grow your lack. Generally speaking, this tends to be the case. But it's not an absolute guarantee. There are some people who didn't work for it and just inherited a fortune. And there are others who work their fingers to the bone and never got ahead. And so we have to understand things the way they really are. So there is cause and effect. So when you look at these spiritual concepts and you recognize, well, yes, there is cause and effect to life. So there are things that I can do that will generally tend to produce a like result. Then that puts you in your personal power, which can be helpful. But we shouldn't believe, we should not believe that everyone is getting exactly what they deserve because it's not true. Heaven's reward fallacy is a distorted way of thinking. It's a distortion. And many of us have felt that. Many of us uh, feel that, especially those of us who really try to be the good guy or the good gal. We get out there and we really put, put our effort in and we may have become number one in our class or number one in the church or very prominent in the community. We prided ourselves on being a good wife or a good husband. But if you're doing it thinking that you're going to get rewarded as a result, you will be rudely awakened. You will not get a reward in this lifetime for everything good that you do. You will not. Also, that means you may not get caught for the bad things you do, but I'm not advocating you do bad things because you just may reap what you sow. And so don't sow seeds of evil. A cousin to heaven's reward fallacy is sunken cost fallacy. And this is very dangerous because it keeps uh, men and women in abusive situations. The sunken cost fallacy is, of course, the feeling that since you've put so much into a relationship, you can't walk away now. So you become like the proverbial person at the slot machine who's putting in coin after coin after coin. And you say on your 98th, I can't walk away. I've already put in 98 coins. I'll lose all of it if I walk away now. And so you put in a 99th. And then you lose again. And you say, I can't walk away now because I've put in 99 coins. And so you put in a 100th and you lose again. And you say, I can't walk away now. And you see how this can continue to go. And, and not only in the world of gambling does this keep people caught in a cycle of loss, but in relationships where we are codependent, we continue to put in and put in and to give and to give and to sacrifice and to sacrifice. And every time we do, we are met with abuse and neglect and abandonment. And what do we say? Well, I can't leave now. I've already put in so much. If I walk away now, I will lose everything that I've invested. You could be thinking of the time. You could be thinking of the energy. You could be thinking of the money because you paid for this man to go to school and you bought him a car. 
because you paid for this woman to get her beauty treatments. You could be thinking of the expenses, but you're getting so caught up in what you've lost, you have sunken cost fallacy, which is the belief that if you don't keep going, you will you 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 will have lost more. But in reality, if you do keep going, you will lose more. Sunken cost fallacy is dangerous. It's cognitive distortion. And it will cause you to continue to reinvest in relationships that you should walk away from. And so how do we break out of sunken cost fallacy? Well, we need to update our beliefs. For instance, a healthy belief when it comes to investing is it's better to cut your losses. It's better to cut your losses. What does that mean? Well, that term actually comes from the London Stock Exchange, which was founded in the 1800s. It just means that it's better to just snip, snip, recognize that you lost a bunch of money and walk away. Because what unsavvy investors tend to do is say, oh, I've lost a bunch of money. I should invest more into this stock so that I so that all of that loss doesn't turn into loss, but I have a chance of gaining it back. I can win it back again. And that's what codependents believe when they keep putting in all of that work, all of that effort into their relationship with their spouse, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, just hoping, maybe if I try one more time, maybe if I just do a little bit harder, maybe if I just keep going, there will be a chance that they will change or that they will go back to the person they once were. But it's better to cut your losses. Let that sink for a moment. In fact, even in your notes, you might write, sunken cost, and you put a cross through it, and you write the new belief. It's better to cut your losses. It's better to cut your losses and walk away. Why is that better? Now let's examine the evidence. And underneath, you can write down the evidence of why it's better to cut your losses and walk away instead of to reinvest and to keep investing. Why is it better to cut your losses? Well, because once you've identified that your stock is not yielding a return, then you have reason to believe based on the past that it will continue to not yield a return. In other words, when you're looking at this spouse, this person, this parent that you keep giving and giving and giving and giving to, once you recognize that based on the pattern of the past, they're not a wise investment, you must stop investing cut your losses, and move on. If you cut your losses here, you could avoid losing more. It certainly is terrible to lose $100 or 100000 but it's better than losing 200 And that's why it's better to cut your losses and to move on. It's important for us to recognize when we've lost, when we've made a mistake, when we've had an unwise investment, and to know that if this saying came from the stock exchange, that means that even wise investors lose money. The difference with a successful investor is that they knew how to stop losing <laughs> on one particular investment. They knew how to diversify. Do you know what it means to diversify? It means to spread out the cash a little bit. Instead of just continuing to put it into one thing, they take their cash and they, they put it into other stocks so that they can hedge their losses, which means something will win to offset the losses over here instead of just putting all of your eggs into one basket. Likewise, it may be time for you to diversify and cut your losses, meaning instead of putting all of your time and your energy into this parent that you're hoping is going to change, and they're not. Or this man that you're hoping is going to change, and they're not. Or this adult child that you're hoping you're going to get this relationship with, and you're not. To take some of that energy and reinvest it back into yourself, into your loves, into your, into your hobbies. 
into your interests, into your purpose. When you reinvest into things that you have more control over, those are called wise investments. And it's like you got the insider scoop. Invest in your purpose. When you invest more time and energy into yourself, you're going to have more to show for it in the end. So from this point, we want to make sure you have understanding of what we're talking about here. If you're just joining us, we've been talking about heaven's reward fallacy and sunken cost fallacy. Heaven's reward fallacy is the false thinking that you will be rewarded for all the good that you do. And you found as a survivor of abuse, doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes, sometimes it just doesn't go in your favor and you tried. Why is this? Well, understand, once you have wickedness and imperfection in your world, that's going to throw off the results so that you can't have a perfectly karma-balanced system where everything you do will be rewarded likewise and everything bad will be rewarded. It can't work that way because with imperfection, uh, this means that you'll make mistakes and others will make mistakes as well. With mistakes being the case that, in, that enters in a randomness factor, an X factor to life. So that since you're making mistakes and other people make mistakes, that means you will suffer even though you didn't deserve to suffer. Someone could accidentally back their car into a human being. That human being will then suffer, although they don't mean to suffer. It's because of imperfection. And the other person who backed the car into that person didn't mean to do that. And they may not be punished for what they did. And the person who got the car backed into them didn't necessarily deserve what happened to them. This is the world we live in. It's a world of no guarantees. That's the world we live in. It's a world of no guarantees. Now, don't get us wrong. There is cause and effect. So you can still work hard and make things happen. But it doesn't always mean that there is a guarantee that it will happen just like that. All we're doing is upping the probability. So we have to recognize that. We have to recognize the probability in everything. So how can we correct this heaven's reward fallacy? If you're the type of person who's been trying to be the good girl, trying to be the good guy, does it mean that we should now go to the other extreme? And be like, all right, I'm going to be the bad boy then. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to care about anything. I'm just going to do evil. Since, hey, it doesn't all work out, right? Well, well, now we're going to the other extreme. And extreme thinking is cognitive distortion. Nihilism is the rejection of all religious and moral principles and the belief that everything is meaningless. Don't slip into nihilism. That's not going to help you. It's extreme thinking. Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure and self-indulgence <laughs> with the belief that there is no retribution for the bad and the good. It doesn't matter. So, so let me just pursue pleasure. Well, again, we're getting into extreme thinking. Or on the other hand, you have learned helplessness, which is victim mentality. This is the idea that no matter what I do, I'm going to fail anyway. It's all going to go wrong for me. And so, again, we don't do anything. And as a result, we're not helping to shape our own reality. So then, Roman, what? If I can't be nihilistic or hedonistic, if I can't be the victim mentality, but you're also telling me that even if I do do well, it may not all work out, then what is the balanced way to think? We need to live in personal power. We have to live in personal power. When you live according to personal power, uh, it keeps you more grounded. You see, when, when you have a false idea of power, this is what gets us into the cognitive distortions, judgments and decrees or heaven's reward fallacy, like I am more powerful than you really are such as law of manifestation, this idea that everything that happens to you is because you manifested it. 
you must have done something to manifest that and to make that happen. This is a false belief. Everything that happens to you is not because you created it. You're not that powerful. You're not that big a deal. Let's just be honest. We're not that big a deal. We didn't make everything that happened. Some of the things you you experience in your life are because someone else caused it or because it was just happenstance in an imperfect world. Okay. So, so with personal power, we're able to see ourselves as human, but as powerful humans, as kings and queens, not gods, but as bosses. So what are you the boss over? Personal power is living in side of your own ability your own real ability and focusing on what you can do. Personal power is living in your own real ability and focusing on what you can do. You can shape your reality in many ways, not absolute, not perfectly, and there's no guarantees, but you can shape your reality in that you have the biggest influence over what you will become and what you will do in your life. You have the biggest influence. No one else or nothing else has a greater influence over what you will become in your life. So you are not your trauma. That's not, that's not your definition. That's not your identity. You are what you want to be. So you can place your mind on your goals, on what you want to become or what you want to produce, and you can move toward that. And because of cause and effect, you are now upping the chances of your own success. Does that make sense? Again, you can set a goal, you can move toward it, and you can up the chances of your own success. But you cannot guarantee that it's all going to work out perfectly according to your timetables. So with this, we'll need relentlessness, the ability to persevere. Perseverance is going and going and going, despite the fact that you will face resistance, despite the fact that certain things will not go your way. So we should actually expect that sometimes things won't go our way, shouldn't we? Absolutely. Because we have to bring in that X factor. It's simple math. There's a variable in everything we do. And the variable is that we live in an imperfect world full of wickedness. So it may not work out. So you can get married if you want to. You can get married. But it may not work out. And it might not be your fault. You can have a child if you want to. But it may not work out with the child. You could not have a good relationship or become estranged later in the child's life. Or the child could choose to, mis to misbehave. And it could not necessarily be your fault. You can go after that job, but it may not work out. So I'm not saying don't do these things. I'm saying do them understanding the way the world works. Understand that you can pursue it. You can achieve it, but it may not go exactly according to the way you hoped. And you may not always get what you deserve. But don't worry, I have come with some mathematics for you. Because there are percentages to this. This is well illustrated in games and in sports. You know, if you sit down to play a game, uh, does it always go the way you want it to go? No, but you still get involved in the game, right? And you still have fun when you try. And if you try... Isn't it true that you have a better chance of winning the game? Of course. And if you develop skill at the game, doesn't that now up your chances of winning the game again? Absolutely. And so take professional sports as an example. You see the guys go out and they work hard. But the more, the more they put effort in and develop skills, they increase the likelihood of their success. But there's always an opposing force. There's other people who want their success over yours. And that competition creates somewhat of a stalemate so that it's not possible to always win. So any athlete has to recognize, I will not always win, but I will do my best to win as much as possible. And so the best athletes in the world can win the majority of the time, but not all the time. Here's the stats. Tom Brady is probably one of the most winningest athletes right meaning he's just won the most out of any other athlete just about but his win rate is about 75 percent when you break down all the statistics 
meaning he wins about on average 75% of the games he plays, which is fantastic. That's better than most. That's better than most. He wins 75% of the games that he plays. Wow. That's fantastic. But guess what? That means that 25% of his games are losses. He loses 25% of the time. When you take this over hundreds, thousands of games, that means that you have hundreds of losses. Hundreds of times this man has lost. But if he focuses on the loss then he can't snap back in to being a winner again. Meaning when he steps on the field, there is no guarantee. But if there was a guarantee, there would be no game to watch. Doesn't matter how good you are, friend. Doesn't matter how good of a wife you are, how good of a mom you are, how good of a dad or an employee or a boss. Some things are out of your control. And at best, if you're at the top of your game, you will win 75% of the time in this world. That's cause and effect. But please understand, you will experience a 25% to 30% loss. Jot it down in your notes. This is balanced thinking. I will lose 25 to 30% guaranteed. That is a guaranteed loss rate. In your life, at bare minimum, you will try, you will give it your all, and you will still lose about 30% of the time. 30% of your money, 30% of your time will be a waste. It will just not work out for you. 30% of your ideas, this is at minimum. This is at minimum. Is that something that's bad? No. The reality is that the average winning rate is about 50%. The above average, more about 60%. LeBron James, Michael Jordan, They won 65% of the time that they played. Both of them have the exact same winning average, 65%. They will win a little more than half of the time they step on the court. There are no guarantees. It's not about who deserved it more. It's not about who deserved it more. Sometimes it will work out. Sometimes it won't. You can push the average in your favor if you push, if you work harder, if you develop skills. But there will be losses. So learn to embrace that. Embrace that that loss will be a part of life and cut your losses. So here's the right attitude. When you realize that your spouse is a scam because they're just a narcissist or that your girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, adult child or husband or uh, your parents, when you realize that they're fake people, they're just narcissists, just cut your losses. Your attitude should be, oh, well, I knew I'd lose somewhere. Cut your losses and move on. The faster you move on, the faster you can stop the bleeding. The faster you move on, the faster you can stop the loss. So when you get into that situation, instead of asking, why me? Say, why not me? I'm no different than anyone else. Of course, I will experience loss. Cut your losses, friends, and move on.